So, over the past month I've been developing a short 3D horror game and today I really want to share with you some of my oh, sweet development secrets. So, yeah, we're talking about developer shortcuts. Roll the clips. Roll, roll the clips. I'm not a professional figure, artist, developer, or... Okay, story writing. So, story writing is probably the first and most important thing you should do when you sit down and decide to make a game. And story writing isn't really just about writing stories, but also planning mechanics, game worlds, and whatever else for your game. Like, a game like Minecraft has a story. You place blocks. That's the story. For me, personally, I like to start off with a vibe or mood that I want to share with others and basically write a story around that. In that regard, question, so but bear with me, I have to ask it. Are you alive? Does your life feel like sensations and emotions blend in with the static noise that goes on in your head? Well, if you heard me, that means you're probably alive, but maybe the better question here is are you living? And that's what I wanted to talk about in this game. I wanted to write a story based around that. So a story based around perfectionism, monotony and feeling life like a loop. I like to start with 3D modeling because I usually skip over the gearboxing stage for more artistically complete assets. So, I usually like to start off with a main character and for that you need some solid concept art, which I can't really draw. So, I borrowed this cool Miku model I found on Pinterest. And what I usually do is start off with the torso, then model the limbs, then the head and face, the hair and accessories, and the hands and feet for last. Modeling is usually pretty straightforward and enjoyable even, but there's the other elephant in the room. I'm wrapping, texturing. To avoid texturing every single part of the model, I designed some generic patterns that I can reuse across different sections. And whenever I need some custom texture, for example, for the front hair or the face, I just unwrap it and texture it into Blender, and then add more details within Krita. Uh, so in the final texture there is um, some regions for the skin, other for the shirt and blah blah blah. I also experimented with different t-shirt colors before settling on the violet one. Uh, come on, come on, we don't have all day. Okay, so yeah, there she is. Why did I make a model for an FPS or game? I don't know. Shadows. Level modeling can be very time consuming, especially with indoor environments that require tons of props and assets to look right and not look like shit. So uh, what I usually do is avoid making models at all and use textures. It's incredible what you can achieve with a shitty image you found on Pinterest, like literally five minutes ago. So for example, I needed to create a bed for the bedroom, obviously. And um, so I found this sheets image on Pinterest, extended one side of it because I needed the folds, the other side of the bed. I wrapped it around a cuboid in Blender, added some loops and cuts, and displaced the vertices a little. Bada bing, bada boom. This looks like a bed to me. Like any good old, good old granny's bed. Yeah, the, the bed you find at your grandma's house. Well, if even painting textures is too much for you, you can use stencil painting, which is basically slapping an image onto the model without even leaving Blender. So powerful and lazy that it's absurd. And if even stencil painting is too much for you, just literally slap textures onto planes, add some cuts and displace them, and but a big part of what might I say, you have a shit ton of props. 
Okay, so when it comes to programming for your game, it's obviously going to be very specific and very custom made for whatever you need for your project, but there are actually a couple of tips I can give you that I think are worth sharing. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, the data oriented approach. So in this case, I have my player object here in my scene. And on the player, I have the player entity, which is just basically a player manager. The player entity um, fetches on the player object hierarchy every player behavior that there is on it. So, for example, the player entity is actually fetching the player character, the player interact, and all of these other behaviors. All of these scripts actually inherit this interface that is called iPlayer behavior that, that just exposes a simple update with input method. So what is actually going on here? I hate uh, putting references manually in the Unity inspector so what I usually do your entity is fetch them on a wake because I can. So uh, I'm just getting them all and I'm putting them into this list. To briefly talk about the player entity, basically uh, every frame the player fetches the input from the input manager. Uh, there's some checking over here but what actually happens is the player entity updates every iPlayer behavior on the player hierarchy. And this basically lets me uh, disable the player all at once if I want to because I can just exit from the loop without updating anything. So whenever the cuts, a cutscene is playing, whenever a puzzle is being done, I can just stop from the player entity. And also the player entity actually holds the reference to the player data, which is actually what I want to talk about. You noticed I didn't set any um, character velocity speed uh, because it, it's actually all centralized uh, in the player data scriptable object. So as you can see I have some move speed, friction, I friction, all of the uh, character configuration stuff and then I have the game data section. And all of these properties are read-only properties because if we go and check on the player data they're of type locked property. This is a generic class I quickly made to uh, basically help me out. And this player data if we go and check on player entity is actually passed to every to every behavior that the player has. And let's go grab the player character behavior real quick. This inherits from my player behavior and there's the update with input. And in player input there's just everything the player wishes to do in this frame, like the delta time, wish there, wish crouch, look input, wish inter. The player character is actually uh, it's moving the player with some basic uh, quake inspired movement. It is actually using the data from player data to do it. So we're fooling the orientation this is the locked property dot get method and we're doing all of this stuff and at the end of the update frame we're actually updating the player data so in this case the player character is being responsible for the is grounded state the position and the velocity of the player so every other player behavior at any point it needs to know the velocity of the player to uh, do something, I don't know, maybe uh, pull off an effect or something. It just gets it from indirectly from the player character. And that script and the player character never knew each other, they never had to interact with one another. So this basically eliminates the need to manually put references and uh, the script might need to reference that one so I'm going to do a dependency injection on that script and then I'm gonna... It's all fucking useless. This basically removes all of that hassle because it's all centralized and I use it a lot. And when it comes to asynchronous programming, I used it a lot for designing the puzzle system and the cutscene system. So I'm going to actually show you the cutscene system on the bathroom cutscene. Yeah, playable director, if you're familiar with Unity, the playable director is just uh, something that plays timeline assets, so you can play sequences stuff and so on. You can see all of the animations, sound, and blah blah blah. But this is actually not a stock timeline asset, it's a cutscene asset, which is just an extension of the timeline asset. On and search it, I can just add some properties into it. So for example, I can tell the where is the player going to be when the cutscene plays and if it has to warm up. And this is where asynchronous programming comes in very useful. I'm not the best animator, but I manage enough just to get by. If it weren't for freaking wolf! So here's a trick, we're gonna take the spine. I actually just make one walk cycle and then I simply bend the spine towards the direction of movement. 
and play the animation in reverse uh, whenever she walks backwards. The blend 3 is also that stupid since there's only two animations and yeah. What you say? Uh, walk cycles are actually very easy to make? Uh, I see. For other animations, I just suggest you have a good grasp on animation basics. So uh, I'm talking about overshooting movement, accelerating and decelerating limbs, uh, moving limbs into arcs instead of linear paths, and just really basic animation stuff. I also don't make my animations with references, since most of them are clearly very basic, but uh, I try to imagine them in my head and maybe replicate them with my own body and try to animate it from there. Music is very important, it can dictate the whole mood of a scene. I use FL Studio to create tracks and you can check out my older video for more about it. I start off by humming a melody or drawing inspiration from similar tracks that I like and then I just put keys on the piano and grease and repeat until they sound good. Luckily for me, sad and horror tracks are usually simpler because they have a slower tempo and much fewer notes than I don't know, upbeat uh, music or something like that. But you can also experiment and get creative and make music in a bunch of other ways. I like to slow down sounds that I record with pulse stretch and use the output as a basis for other tracks. And like everything else, just experiment a lot, try to find your own ways to compose and create that are also simpler for you. This past month has been very stressful and I wanted to push out this video as soon as possible because I wanted to get it off my chest. Between having to meet deadlines and working on this project, I really feel burnout. Uh, the script for this video was also much longer originally, but I realized that my goal wasn't to make a long video in the first place. My goal was to inspire someone to start creating something beautiful. And you don't have to be an expert or professional to do that. You can start with whatever you can do in the right very moment. And that would make me really happy. And if I succeeded, please just let me know in the comments below. The game I was going to make uh, was also meant to be much simpler in the beginning with much fewer assets and much more simplistic graphics but its scope grew as my tendency for perfectionism <laughs> made itself heard. I wanted it to feel very polished and like uh, worthy of my personal standard even if it ended up lacking a bit in story and content. And lastly I wanted this video to be about the creative process behind it and not about the actual game, so I didn't want to create a dev vlog. Either way, I will publish the game to itch.io uh, before the end of this week since I have to still tidy up a couple of things I left messy on the project, since losing the motivation to keep working on it. So I hope this video didn't feel rushed, boring and that it was still enjoyable to a degree. And please, until next time, take care.